Hey everyone, good afternoon. I'm here to talk to you about Visual Studio Code and some of the improvements that we've made in C++ over the past year. So as far as a quick agenda, I'll give you an overview of Visual Studio Code in case you're not familiar with the product already. Then I'll talk to you about a simpler experience that we've developed over the past year for how you can use VS Code. I'll run into a demo and show you the new features live and in action. I'll talk about IntelliSense and how we've improved the performance over the past year. And finally, I will end you with the most exciting demo I have for you today, which is about Visual Studio Code remote development. Starting with the overview, VS Code is a free open source code editor. It runs on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, and any combination thereof. As of 2018, it was the number one most used code editor in the world. And the way in which you can use C++ in Visual Studio Code is through our Microsoft C and C++ extension. Since we last met in CppCon 2018, we have a lot of new features in VS Code as far as the extension goes. I'll go over these in a second in a demo, but basically what you'll see here is various code editing, uh, build and debug. We have semantic colorization, one of our top GitHub asks. I know I see some familiar faces in the audience, and some of you have been active spe specifically on that thread. Uh, we have document outline. We have new configuration help. And finally, I'll talk to you a little bit about VC package and how we've integrated that into VS Code. So without further ado, we have 30 minutes here today. Let's just jump into some demos. All right, so the sample code that I'm going to walk you through today is pretty simple. I have a box struct. Here I've defined a length, a width, a height, and I can compute the volume of it. In my main file, I have included this box header file. And the first thing I'll show you is I've defined a box called package. So here we have new dot comment support. I can actually see the comment that was in that header file saying, here I've created a box object. It defines a box and its properties. So you can imagine if you have a much more complicated code base, seeing those comments and where those definitions are coming from without actually having to go to definition and seeing that comment right there for you can be very helpful. The next thing I want to show you is what this include. So we've include, we have improved our include completion. So here now when I start with a quote, I can already just start tab completing here, box.h. Simple as that. The next thing I'd like to show you is a new feature we added called build and debug active file. So as I mentioned, this is a very simple project. If you have projects that are similar to this, if it's a prototype, a single file project, we now have a feature called build and debug active file. So this file that I have open, it's my active file. If I right click and I scroll down to this option, build and debug active file, basically what this does for me is it detects the compiler that I have installed. It then creates a custom tasks JSON file to configure my debugger for me. And then it's going to allow me to actually build and debug my file with just that one click. So you can see here I actually have two compilers installed. I have MinGW and I have my developer command prompt with MSVC. So I'm going to go and use my CLEXE, which is actually my developer command prompt, and debug my file that way. So you see in the terminal, we have the output coming up. My developer prompt shows up, and I'll take in a few parameters. I'll take in my length, my width, my height. Simple as that, it computes the volume. I've hit my breakpoint here, which I simply just put at the end of my file for simplicity's sake. And it's as simple as that to get started with your first project now. Uh, before, you would have to configure that debugger right here I have an option to add a configuration. But here you have that configuration already set up for you with virtually no setup whatsoever. 
you're in Visual Studio Code, you're using a text editor, I know you want to get started quickly, so this is something that is designed to help you there. Next thing I want to mention, which I just gave you a little teaser for, is semantic colorization. Some of you in the audience probably know this, well, where is the semantic colorization in this right now? So we've actually created a new extension for you. This extension is C, C++ themes. And specifically, the themes that we have for you right now are equivalent to the Visual Studio 2017 C and C++ themes. So the way in which I can now enable this theme that I've installed is to use the command palette. So that is Control-Shift-P. And here I have preferences color theme. Control-K, Control-T is the shortcut for that as well. So when I go in here, now notice I have two new themes. Dark Visual Studio C and C++ and Light Visual Studio C and C++. So now when I select the dark theme, look at that. We now have that struct object that's been colored. That is the semantic colorization itself. It's identified that here I have my struct box. I'm referring it to here in my main function. And so now the colors have percolated and you have semantic colorization. If you're interested in learning more about semantic colorization and what types of objects and things we're actually coloring, you can check out our docs. There's a full list of things that we have specifically lit up for C++. So I mentioned a little bit about the configuration itself. You saw a bit of build and debug configuration. But before that, many of you will probably notice when you're writing a Hello World C++ project in Visual Studio Code, there's another configuration step that you need to go through, and that's by way of lighting up IntelliSense. So we know that JSON can be difficult for some people, especially I've been to hackathons and I'm trying to work with students on setting up their first projects and being able to configure a compiler before writing your first Hello World program can be overwhelming. It can also take time. So aside from the JSON, we now have a edit configurations UI available. So here, you can add various configurations. You can look at your compiler path. So to give you a little bit of a comparison as well, this is what my JSON file looks like. So I have a configuration for Windows 32. I have my compiler path and all of that. So when I go to my edit configurations file, I now have those same properties but you get these additional descriptions and ways in which you can add configuration. So I can simply add a new configuration and I can set that up with its own properties. Here I'm going to stick with my Windows 32. And as I mentioned with various compilers before, here you see the set of compilers I have. I have quite a few compilers because I work between Windows and Linux on a daily basis. So this will allow you to pretty easily set up your configurations. So the next thing I'd like to show you is with VC Package. Just a quick show of hands. How many people in the audience have heard of VC Package before? OK, so a fair amount of you. How many of you use VC Package? Much smaller number. OK, well, hopefully, this integration I'm about to show you can help you use VC Package a lot more easily. So those of you who are not familiar, VC Package is a cross-platform package manager for C and C++. You can acquire various libraries. We have about 1,000 libraries available for you. Last I checked, we had about 1,100. And so what you can do is essentially install the libraries, install their dependencies, and you have a nice little manager for yourself that is equivalent to pip in Python or npm in Node. So here, I basically looked up Boost Math, and I took the first Stack Overflow code response that was there. Quite a few upvotes for it, a couple hundred actually, and I copied and pasted that code into this sample project. But I don't actually have Boost Math installed. So of course I get this red air squiggle, and IntelliSense does not detect it. What we've recently released is an experimental version of this for you, where you can actually copy that VC package command so that you're able to install it to your clipboard. So here it's detected that that command is for boost math, and I can copy that now to my clipboard. So if I go into my terminal 
and now I'm in VC package. I have to be in that directory. All I do is copy paste, start running the install command. I'm not going to have you sit here and watch me install Boost Math for the next five minutes of my presentation. But essentially, once this finishes installing, this air squiggle will go away. You'll have your package installed. Uh, some of you might have seen our Visual Studio talk yesterday by Marion and Sai. And something you might have noticed there with the VC package integration is that you can actually install the package without having to copy it to the clipboard. That's something that we're working on bringing into Visual Studio Code in the next release. So that's something that you can also look forward to. You don't have to actually go through that step of copy pasting. We'll do that for you. So cutting back over to the slides here, a simple recap. We looked at dot comments when you hover over the box struct, for example. Include autocomplete and how we've improved that. Uh, we looked at member function autocompletion. So you saw the volume that I had there and how that member function had various inputs. Basically, we've improved how you can complete that member function in general. Uh, we also have the document outline, which actually forgot to show that to you guys. But basically right here, you can see that I have doc outline support now in C++. That's a fairly new improvement as well. We looked at build and debug active file, one of our neat new features. Configuration settings, editor UI, which can get you set up a lot quicker now. Semantic colorization, happy to say, one of our top GitHub asks, now closed. And we have our include header help with VC package, which we will continue adding to in the future with VC package, other package managers, and more package management-like features in the editor. Switching gears a little bit, I want to talk to you about improved IntelliSense performance that we've added. So we've introduced IntelliSense caching. Essentially, what this does is it precompiles your headers for you. So if you opened up a file once, you open it up again, that IntelliSense information is in an IntelliSense cache, and it'll load much quicker. We got a lot of feedback from the community about IntelliSense being slow. And so this is our first pass at improving that, impro improving that performance. So typically, you'll see about 2 to 4x improvement. It depends, of course, on how large your file is, how many errors you might have, what IntelliSense is actually parsing through. As far as the settings themselves, once again, going back to the feedback you've provided us with, there were two things related to the settings. First of which is the cache path. So this, by default, goes to your VS Code CPP tools folder. Uh, this is something that we had changed since we first released it. Initially, it went into that VS Code folder, but we know a lot of you uh, use source control with VS Code, and you check that in and you didn't want your IntelliSense caching information to be checked in. So we created a separate directory. So that's VS Code CPP tools. If you want to change your cache path, there is a setting in which you can do that, which I have pasted up here. The other setting of which is the cache size. Once again, we got a lot of feedback from you guys. Uh, a lot of people are using VS Code on their laptops, which have a small SSD on there. So you want that cache size to be a lot smaller. So what I've shown up here is the default cache size. If you don't want caching at all, you can set that to zero or anywhere in between what you want the max cache size to be for your project. So to the last portion of the talk, remote development with Visual Studio Code. I've spoken to many of you today about remote development, so it sounds like this is an area of interest. I'd like to spend a little bit more time on it uh, today in this talk. So, Remote development with Visual Studio Code, what can you actually do with this? Uh, you can easily develop your programs on one operating system, which would be your local OS, and target any other operating system that you choose. So let's say you want to sandbox your development environment. If you have runtimes that are not available on your local OS, but you need it for your source code, you can access an existing environment from many different locations. You can also debug an application running somewhere else with those native tools. So let's talk about the architecture a little bit. How this actually works. What this required was a re-architecture of Visual Studio Code itself. We took Visual Studio Code and we broke down and abstracted out the back end and the front end. 
So your local OS running, this is going to have anything UI related. So it'll have any UI extensions that you might have. It'll have any themes. So how I showed you before that new Visual Studio uh, CNC++ theme, that is going to be running on your local OS. But what you could have in your remote OS is all the rest of that goodness. You have your source code itself. You have your processes, the debugger. So as I'm saying, like I can sit here on my Windows machine. I can debug remotely SSH into Linux and get my GCC debugger. I can get my build tools in that area. And in addition to that, we have this VS Code server, which runs all your extensions. So now I can have my C and C++ extension for which I get my context of Linux IntelliSense. So really, your host OS, it doesn't matter. You can target code anywhere. And there are basically three ways in which you can use remote development. So if you get the remote development extension pack, there are three extensions within that. There's containers, there's SSH, and there's WSL, which is the Windows subsystem for Linux. Given how much time I have, I really only have time to show you one of these extensions. So today I'll be showing you the Windows subsystem for Linux extension. In the future, I'll be putting out blog posts and videos about the other two, which are containers and SSH. Also, if you have questions for me about those two particularly, I'll be hanging around after this talk at the Microsoft booth, so you can come and talk to me about that. So on to the demo itself. So let's go back into Visual Studio Code. First thing you'll notice here is I have this little green icon in the bottom left corner. That is for remote development itself. So this is how you open a new remote window. Just to show you the extensions I have, here I have my remote WSL extension. So that's what I'll be using here today. So I have these options for all the different remote connections that I can make. I'm going to choose the first one, which is my remote WSL new window. So here we're starting VS Code in WSL Ubuntu 18.04. So those of you who might not be familiar with WSL already, it's the Windows subsystem for Linux. It's a way in which you can run native Linux binaries, specifically ELF binaries, on a Windows machine. You get various tools like the system package manager. So in this case, Ubuntu gives you apt. So I can say apt install whatever package I want. I can also get any of the compilers, just built-in tools that are there in Ubuntu 18.04. I launched this window. Um, in remote development, it picks my default distribution. So my default distro is Ubuntu 18.04. So here I'm going to go into now the remote connection. I can see what I'm connected to here on the bottom left. So I'm editing in Ubuntu 18.04. As you can imagine, you have many different remote connections open. If you want to get Inception-like with this, you totally can too. So I can have remote WSL open. I can then SSH somewhere else. And then I can get into a container. Once again, the interest of time, I can't show you all of that. But just a little teaser of what you can do with it. So now when I go to open a folder, notice that I have root here. I'm not actually in the Windows context of my development at all anymore. Now I'm in WSL. I'm running WSL2, so I actually have my separate file system. So now I'm in my root, or I'm in my bin bash context. So here I have a folder that I created for some simple projects. I have the most simplest of projects here, where I basically have a Hello World project. So here it's starting up Ubuntu. It pulled this project in. And so here, very simple project. I'll take in an input, give myself an output. Notice here that the terminal that by default shows up is bash. So it identifies the fact that I'm in Ubuntu. It looks at what the default terminal there is. I have bash. You might have ZSH or something else. But here, by default, I have that. And so now I can go ahead and use GCC. Notice that I'm not even creating a new configuration for this. I did have two configurations um, in that UI. So I had my Win32 and I have a WSL. So I'm actually, by default, going into my WSL configuration. That's something that I had set up previous to this talk. So let's go through. Go. 
and create a simple out file and obviously my favorite conference is CPPCon. And so there you go, just like that. You have my Windows machine here, I'm targeting Linux, and it was as simple as that to get started with it. There are, as I mentioned, two other extensions, but this is it, this is the WSL context, so I can use any of my Linux tools that I had on Ubuntu already installed. So even something that I want to run, like screen fetch to show you that I'm actually running WSL, I can have that in my integrated terminal here. And there you see, I'm running on this Microsoft kernel. It's Ubuntu on Windows. So switching back to a quick recap of what I just showed you, I showed you the WSL Visual Studio Code remote development extension. Uh, there virtually was no setup to the extension. It really was just creating that separate configuration. Uh, you can configure your compiler if you'd like. I just use the GCC compiler that comes in with Ubuntu 18.04, and I didn't make any additional configurations on that. But as you can imagine, you can get various versions of GCC, whatever compiler you want, you can configure it. And we ran a simple Hello World program targeting Linux. The other two remote development extensions, as I, as I have mentioned before, we have SSH and containers. So a couple things to mention about these two extensions themselves. SSH allows you to connect to, let's say you have a virtual machine. So we're essentially using your SSH key to do so. We're not taking in your password, so you'll need to work in that context um, with SSH. As far as containers go, this is mainly with Docker containers. You can connect to other types of containers, but the best experience that you're going to get is with Docker. Also to mention, Visual Studio Code Remote Development released in May, so we're also really looking for feedback and if you run into anything unexpected. So please do file bugs on us. Please do ask questions. This is really important for us in the future of this development and how we're spending a lot of time in this area. So starting to round out, round out the talk, that's basically all of the demos and the basic content that I have for you. I want to talk a little bit about what's coming next. So many of you might have noticed that our extension is a preview extension. We are working towards our next release, a version 1.0 release. So some things that you'll get in the version 1.0 of the extension are the top GitHub issues that you've asked for. Uh, we're working hard at getting these features out the door, specifically find all references, refactor, rename. You saw a preview of document outline today. Some of those features are complex in nature, which is why you've had to wait for them a little bit longer. We did actually just release, release a very experimental version of find all references, and we're improving that literally by the day. So if you're on Insiders, that is a way in which you can get the early bits and try those out. We also have build and debug improvements coming up, specifically for Makefile and CMake. So we're working on a set of improvements for Makefile as well as for CMake. We are actually now the primary maintainers of the CMake tools extension. So with that, we'll be adding a lot more improvements as far as CMake, integrating that with our extension as well. And then package management integrations. I showed you a little bit of what's possible with the VC package copy to clipboard. A couple things that we're working on coming up in the next month or so, we'll be automatically installing missing header files. So you saw copy to clipboard. The next option that comes there is install. So you could literally say install boost math. It'll do everything in the background for you and get that package with virtually no work on your end. Another thing that we're working on is for searching and curating libraries. So there I copied and pasted code from Stack Overflow and I knew what library I want to use. But let's say I was starting out with a computer vision project and I didn't actually know what libraries I needed or what code needed to be included. So something we're looking at is giving that search functionality for you in the VS Code environment itself. So you could say, hey, computer vision, what shows up? There's a VC package CLI search feature, OpenCV will be the top result there. So those are some things that we're looking at. 
once again, like this is a really community driven project. So we love your feedback. Please provide it. Please keep providing it for us. And we're listening. So those top GitHub issues, for example, that we are going to resolve, those are the kinds of things that we're looking for from you moving forward to this 1.0 release. Finally, I have some resources here. So if you have any feedback, here's Twitter, great place to reach myself and our team. I get notifications, so if you tweet at me, I'll see what you have to say. I'll respond as quickly as I can. Issues and feature requests, we ask that you put those on GitHub so that we can track the upvotes that we can have a longer dialogue with you. I actually post specs for all of the features that we're going to release on GitHub to get feedback. So that's something, for example, how we got the settings editor UI to where it is, is going back and forth with people on that thread to get the feedback loop going. Resources, we have docs, the blog, if you want to stay up to date with the newest features that we have every time we release, which is about every six to eight weeks, there'll be a blog post up about the new features and demoing that for you. Um, I have just a couple minutes left, and I wanted to leave at least two minutes for questions, so I'll quickly blaze through these last few slides. Come say hi to us at the booth. Uh, we'll be there until Thursday. So after this talk, I'll pop over to the booth. If you have any questions for me, please do ask. We have our wonderful team members who will be there as well who can help answer questions for you. Um, and so with that, I will leave up the resources slide and open the floor for a couple questions. Hi. Uh, is the VC package uh, tool uh, integrates with the CMake tool? Yeah, so the VC package tool does integrate with CMake. I mean the automatic uh, installation of libraries and et cetera. So the automatic installation on VS Code does yeah. not work with CMake currently. So but you it's, do plan to? Yes. So short answer is yes, we do plan to add that integration. We actually have the CMake integration available in Visual Studio. So that's the first place that we've lit it up. We're getting feedback on that. <laughs> if you saw Marion and Sai speak yesterday, and you can check out the YouTube video if you didn't, there is an automatic install feature uh, that is integrated directly with CMake and Visual Studio. We're looking for a really similar set of functionality here in VS Code. So short answer, yes. It's coming. It's on its way. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm curious. Is there any plan to support like open the uh, Visual Studio solution file and maybe build from it? Sorry, could you repeat the second part of that? To uh, open the solution file where? Uh, open the Visual Studio solution file and maybe build it like in Visual Studio code or at least understand it. Yeah. So as far as the plans for opening up the Visual Studio solution file in VS Code, there's no direct plan to do that. Mm -hmm. um, however, you can literally like open up any folder, any project in VS Code. There's no direct integration to open that up, but like you can use it. We don't specifically build that solution file for you. Uh, yeah, it just like they're included in past something like just will be messed up if like the Visual Studio doesn't understand the solution file. Mm -hmm. like forward, that kind yeah, of as far as the include path, I hear you. That's something with the configuration that's a little bit difficult. That's why we've added um, additional help in the configuration setting, settings editor UI. Uh, as far as the include path in the future, we're hoping to make it a simpler setup. So maybe not directly okay. getting your solution file in VS Code, but as far as the include path, we're working to improve that part of the um, settings experience. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, thanks. I'm pressed for time here, so I'll make it quick. Mm -hmm. um, can you target Red Hat Linux with WSL or perhaps CentOS? So yes, you can. You can't get it from the Windows Store itself. But what you can do is use a project called the Distro Launcher to sideload Red Hat on your machine. And if you want to deploy that to your team, um, you can do so. I can. So distro launcher is the called, trick. Yeah, it's, I don't have internet access, but it's github.com slash WSL slash WSL dash distro launcher. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, everyone. And I'll be at the booth to answer more questions if you have anything else.